हेलो वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला कॉस लीगल लिटरेसी आई एम आरुक एडनवाला आई प्रैक्टिसिंग लॉयर हु इज गोइंग टू टीच पार्ट ऑफ दिस कॉस द सब्जेक्ट पब्लिक इंटरेस्ट लिटिगेशन पार्ट टू इन दिस पार्ट we are going to look at epistolary jurisdiction we are also going to look at judicial activism and the changing trends in public interest litigation the supreme court and the high courts have been converting letters sent to them indicating violation of fundamental rights into public interest litigation this is the epistolary jurisdiction of the high court and the supreme court please read the second bullet point before that i would like to mention that sp gupta's case was one of the first case which detailed the particulars of public interest litigation and its significance it was a case regarding transfer of judges from one high court to the other which lawyers had challenged on the ground that it adversely affects the independence of the judiciary the second bullet point is part of the sp gupta's case procedure is but a handmaiden of justice and the cause of justice can never be allowed to be thwarted by any procedural technicalities here the judgment says that mere technicalities and formalities should not deprive a person to attain social justice a person may not be able to approach the court because he may not be able to handle the technicalities and formalities which are required in a regular writ petition in sp gupta's case the supreme court continues to say proactive goal oriented approach should be the focus what do we mean by that by that we mean the supreme court has to be proactive in ensuring that people enjoy their fundamental rights the supreme court cannot be a silent spectator they have to innovate and bend the technicalities and formalities to ensure that a person enjoys his rights which are given to him on the constitution and statutes the last bullet point is a portion from the bandwa mukti morcha case it would not be right or fair to expect a person acting pro bono publico to incur expenses out of his own pocket for going to a lawyer and preparing a regular writ petition for being filed in court for enforcement of the fundamental right of the poor and deprived sections of the community so your bandwa mukti mocha case was one of the first cases where the supreme court converted a letter showing violation of fundamental rights and continuation of bonded labor in faridabad Bandwa Mukti Morcha an organization had sent a postcard bringing this to the notice of the Supreme Court which was converted into a public interest litigation. Ha huh. now let us look the next two slides deal with certain portions of the SP Gupta case. This portions show us the significance of the PIL and what the court is to do to ensure people's fundamental rights are protected or a person whose fundamental rights are violated is able to seek redress the supreme court says who are living in poverty and destitution who are barely eking out a miserable existence with their sweat and toil who are helpless victims and ex- of an exploitative society and do not have easy access to justice this court will not insist on a regular writ petition to be filed by the public spirited individual espousing the cause and seeking relief for them 
This court will readily respond even to a letter addressed by such individual acting pro bono publico. It is true that there are rules made by this court prescribing the procedure for moving this court for relief under Article 32 and they require various formalities to be gone through by a person seeking to approach this court. But it must not be forgotten that procedure is but a handmaiden of justice and the cause of justice can never be allowed to be thwarted by any procedural technicalities. The court would therefore unhesitatingly and without the slighted qualms of conscience cast aside the technical rules of procedure in the exercise of its dispensing power and treat the letter of the public-minded individual as a writ petition and act upon it. So so what do we get from this portion of the S.P. Gupta judgment? One, that the downtrodden have also access to, oh, one, that the down, sorry, sorry. One, that the downtrodden should also have access to justice in the same manner as the rest. Two, a public-spirited person may file a public interest litigation on behalf of those whose fundamental rights have been violated. Three, he, the cause cannot expect the, public in, the petitioner in a public interest litigation to undergo difficulty in filing a public interest litigation. Hence, technicalities and formalities require to be bent and a court will entertain a letter which shows violation of fundamental rights into a public interest litigation. CO Moto PIL. What do we mean by CO Moto? CO Moto PIL is a PIL which is taken up by the court on its own motion. No petitioner has filed the PIL. The court has noticed maybe a newspaper article or a report which denotes that fundamental rights are being violated. The court will convert this newspaper article or report into a PIL. This is a Suomoto PIL. Hence, the media play an extremely important role in bringing to the notice of the public and the courts that fundamental rights of an individual or a particular group are being violated. A proactive media will result in a proactive judiciary with regards to suo moto PILs. Amicus curiae. Who is an amicus curiae? An amicus curiae is a friend of the court. A friend a Amicus curiae is appointed by the court to assist the court in a petition, especially in a suomoto PIL where there is no petitioner or petitioner's advocate to assist the court. Who can the court appoint as an amicus curiae? The court will appoint an amicus curiae depending upon the subject matter of the case. It could be a lawyer, an academic institution such as a social work institution, an organization or an expert on the topic. It is preferable to have an expert or an NGO working on that subject matter to be appointed as an amicus curiae as they will be better able to assist the courts. Judicial activism. Courts play a dynamic role to ensure justice to the people. This upsets the legislature and the executive. The legislature and the executive have been often known to say that the courts are interfering in their domain. They are interfering in matters of governance. The court's reply to that is, what should the court do when they notice that people's fundamental rights are being violated on a daily basis and the judiciary and the executive is doing nothing to repair the same? Let us see what Article 50 of the Constitution states. It deals with separation of judiciary from executive. It states that the state shall take steps to separate the judiciary from the executive in the public services of the state. Hence, 
in our country, each, all three arms of the state are independent. But we should also notice that in our constitution, the separation of powers is not stringent. It is based on the system of checks and balances. For example, the parliament has the right to impeach a judge who does not abide with the constitution. In the same way, the judiciary has a right to set aside executive action or a law which is not in accordance with fundamental rights. We've seen that in the field of judicial activism, the Supreme Court and the High Courts have been filed passing several judgments. It is also important to note that one, of the, uh, one arm of the state cannot assume the powers of another arm of the state. I would also like to mention that in the new liberal air era, where constitutional values are constantly being diluted, it is very important for the court to stand up and ensure that the legislature and the executive adheres to constitutional values. Private interest. The higher judiciary has been very strict when public private interest has been disguised as public interest. They have been castigating such petitioner. The Supreme Court has repeatedly said that in PIL, the motives of the petitioner should be bona fide. They should approach the court with clean hands to represent the violations of fundamental rights of the downtrodden and of the weaker sections of society and not to reflect any private interest. B. Singh versus Union of India, the Supreme Court castigated the petitioner for approaching the court in what they believed was a frivolous matter. In this matter, the petitioner had challenged the appointment of a high court judge. A person acting bona fide and having sufficient interest in the proceeding of public interest litigation will alone have a locus standi and can approach the court to wipe out violation of fundamental rights and genuine infraction of statutory provisions, but not for personal gain or private profit or political motive or any oblique consideration. The Supreme Court, after saying this, also also awarded costs of rupees 10,000 upon the petitioner. The Supreme Court is very clear that they want to wean out malicious PILs from the genuine ones. Courts will entertain PILs where the motive is bona fide. But it is very worrisome because the awarding of costs may result in genuine petitioners fearing to approach the Supreme Court or the High Court in PIL. State of Uttarkhand versus Balwan Singh Chauffal's case, the Supreme Court has laid down certain principles which should be followed with regards to PILs. This judgment is also to identify the genuine PILs from the frivolous one. In this PIL, the High Court had entertained the plea challenging the appointment of an advocate general. The Supreme Court said that this point had been well settled in the past and therefore this petition was frivolous. It, award, it awarded costs of rupees 1 lakh to the petitioner. In this judgment, the Supreme Court says, Instead of every individual judge devising his own procedure for dealing with the public interest litigation, it would be appropriate for each high court to properly formulate rules for encouraging the genuine PIL and discouraging the PIL filed with oblique motives. Consequently, we request that the high courts who have not yet framed the rules should frame the rules within three months. 
Pursuant to this judgment, high courts have filed their rules regarding this aspect. Certain high courts have called upon petitioners to deposit an amount of security in order to testify their bona fides. If the petition is found to be frivolous, such security will be for forfeited. Other, other courts have laid down imposition of costs in case of finding out that the petition was in private interest. In the Balwan Singh Chaufal's case, the Supreme Court continues to say, the courts before entertaining the PIL should ensure that the PIL is aimed at redressal of genuine public harm or public injury. The court should also ensure that there is no personal gain, private motive or oblique motive behind filing this public interest litigation. The court should also ensure that the petitions filed by busybodies for extraneous and ulterior motives must be discouraged by imposing exemplary costs or by adopting similar novel methods to curb frivolous petitions and the petitions filed for extraneous consideration. The focus is on separating frivolous petitions filed in private interest from public interest litigation. That should not deter a petitioner from approaching the court in PIL if it is a genuine case in public interest litigation. This judgment and the rules framed by the High Court should not look and be treated as a deterrent by petitioners. Changing trends in PIL. Nowadays, we see that persons approaching the Supreme Court and the High Court and the PIL are not those representing the downtrodden or the marginalized section of society. In fact, the marginalized sections of society are being targeted under this public interest litigation. We see residential colonies filing public interest litigation for demolition of unorganized settlements in the vicinity on the ground that the right to a decent environment is being violated. Also, pedestrians are targeting hawkers who are eking out a livelihood on the ground that the right to move freely around on the pedestrians is on the pavements is being violated. The Supreme Court and the High Courts will have to be very careful to t ensure that the rights of the weaker sections are not violated under the name of public interest. I would also like to note that the courts have refused to intervene in policy decisions. The courts have repeatedly said that policy decisions are to be made in parliament. The only role of the court is to see whether when the policies are being implemented, fundamental rights and other statutory provisions are not being violated. In all other cases, the High Court and the Supreme Court have restrain themselves from interfering in policy decisions. So this is quite frightening in a neoliberal era where we see that the tenets of the preamble are daily being violated. We require a strong judiciary to pull back the executive and the legislature who is violating these constitutional principles. Hence, more and more policy decisions are being taken to the court for redressal, but sadly, mostly, the courts are not interfering in the same. In the Delhi Science Forum versus Union of India, in 1996, the petitioners had challenged the state action in granting licenses to private companies for telecommunication services. In this judgment also, the Supreme Court did not interfere. The Supreme Court held that it was the policy decision of the state to do so. There may be views and views, opinions and opinions, which may be shared and believed by citizens of the country, including the representatives of the people in parliament. 
but that has to be sorted out in parliament, which has to approve such policy. No direction can be given or is expected from the courts unless while implementing such policies, there is violation or infringement of any of the constitutional or statutory provisions. Now, what I would like to examine is that we saw that the scope under PIL is very limited. Hence, if an issue arises where people's fundamental rights are being violated, filing a PIL should be the last resort. A social worker to, should encourage and facilitate the following steps prior to filing a public interest litigation. Step one, educate oneself about the issue to identify whether fundamental rights, provisions of covenants are violated by the state and what is the best mode of redress. Hence, the social worker will have to educate himself in order to be able to identify the correct strategy to ensure that fundamental rights are protected in a particular situation. It will have to be a very mature social worker who with a very mature petitioner will have to decide whether such case can be entertained by the courts. We must understand that some issues have a legal solution whereas other issues do not. Step two, awareness about the issue. To inform people about the likely impact of state's action that it amounts to violation of fundamental rights, alternative strategies that may be adopted. All this should be discussed with the people at the community level. They should know what the impact of a particular project is going to be upon their livelihood and upon their lives. Also, alternative strategies should be put forth before the people. Let them decide or you facilitate them in deciding what strategy should be adopted. Point three, organizing the people. To take the issue further, disseminate information and garner support. Prepare material in the support, scientific studies, fact-finding reports. It is important for the social worker to organize the local people. You the social worker should help in identifying leaders who will take the issue into the community, will inform the rest of the community about what the pros and cons of the proposed state action are. Point four, advocacy. To spread the issue among the public. Experts on this issue, eminent personalities through media and public meetings. It is very important to garner public support and public opinion in favor of your cause. How are you going to do that? You could go do by going and meeting with different experts who are working on the field, meeting getting support of eminent personalities and the rest of the public. That can be done with the help of journalists through the media, holding press conferences or ensuring that press reports are published in support of your cause. Public meetings could also be held to create public opinion in your favor. Step five, lobbying. To put forth people's views to the state, attempt to negotiate an amicable end. It is important to put forth the demands of the people to the appropriate state agencies, to sit across the table and to try and negotiate an amicable solution so that the matter is settled and everyone is happy. Six, direct action. To facilitate holding of demonstration rallies, etc., to indicate people's strength against state conduct or proposal. When all your aforementioned steps fail, what are you supposed to do? People go onto the streets in different forms of direct actions. It may be holding rallies, demonstration, hunger fasts. 
And therefore, advocacy is very important to ensure that your struggles are covered by the media and those who are in support of your cause also come down to support you in your struggles. Filing of PIL after examining the pros and cons of doing so. Sometimes when all of the above steps, the state is still adamant on continuing with their action, a person may have no option but to file a PIL before the High Court or the Supreme Court. But prior to filing the PIL, it is examined that you examine the pros and cons because the court is not going to intervene in all matters, especially those matters which they believe are a policy decision taken by the government. And if you fail in the PIL, then all out of the court negotiations which you've been carried out with the state agencies will also come to an end. In fact, the state agencies very often, when a PIL is filed, stop talking with the concerned parties on the ground that now the matter is sub judice, the matter is before the court. Hence, filing a PIL will result in all the basket, in all the eggs being put in the basket of the court. In yeah, we have seen that the innovative methods of ensuring people's fundamental rights are protected, which started off in the 1970s and the 1980s, has now taken a different trend. It is being used as a tool by a particular section of society to target those for whom PIL was conceptualize. The courts have an extremely important role to ensure that the original concept of PIL is written. A reference material is from the Lawyers Collective magazine dated 7 July 1996. Its cover story is public interest litigation. It is available on the Lawyers Collective website. Please read it because it gives you an overview and the history of public interest litigation.